Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and uh, I feel enormously privileged at the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, could I start with a, an acknowledgement to country uh, from Dubbo in the wonderful world of the Rajri nation? And if I could do that in language, I would appreciate that. Gubara Numga, Yundu Troy Grant, Minister for the Arts. Nadu Bani Du, Gubara, Gadigal, Eora, Mainglang, Numba, Nina, Gira, Durinya, Gaida. It's a Northern Rajuri acknowledgement of the lands and the assembly in which we meet, and my respects to the traditional owners of this land. Can I start by acknowledging Catherine Brisbane, Chair of Currency House, Mr Ian Robertson, Rydlick Holding, sponsors for today, and Tony Grierson from Agus Executive Search, also our sponsors and hosts today. Obviously to Lizanne McGregor, a good friend of mine, and thank you for having us at your venue. I really am delighted to be here to introduce to you today's keynote speaker, Lisa Havilar. Lisa began her arts career as a painter and when unable to find gallery space in Wollongong to exhibit her work, she co-founded and ran Project Contemporary Art Space for Emergency Artists in Wollongong. The process of persuading local government and businesses such as BHP to support an art gallery really whetted her appetite for the business side of art and developing collaborations between artists, government and business. She then became the Assistant Director of the Kasula Powerhouse Arts Centre between 1998 and 2004. And in 2005, she became the Artistic Director of the Campbelltown Arts Centre. In essence, it was Lisa who put Campbelltown on the map for contemporary art by finding and working with local artists and developing innovative programming that was relevant to the local community. The Campbelltown Arts Centre became a multidisciplinary contemporary arts centre which brought artists and communities together. Lisa played a pioneering role that shaped the way in which institutions engage with cultural diversity and their communities. Lisa is also a curator and lecturer and since she became director in 2011 of Carriage Works that institution has had an enormous influence on the contemporary art scene in Sydney. And visitors' numbers have increased from, and you might be staggered by these figures, but typical of a government minister, I have checked them twice. Her visitor numbers have increased from 110,000 a year to 790,000 a year from 2011 to 2015. That is simply amazing. And the reason is that Lisa is the driving force behind Carriage Works' success. However, Lisa herself will talk to you about the team that she leads and the team that makes up and what is Carriage Works and what they do in the service of the artists and the community. Lisa thinks big and she encourages others to think big with the work they bring to Carriage Works. She believes in letting the artists leave the creative process. That's the end of the notes. The reason I'm here this morning is that I am the self-appointed president of the Lisa Havilar fan club. And by the end of today's speech, I'm pretty confident you will all be members of the Lisa Havilar fan club. I've had the enormous privilege of being the Arts Minister in New South Wales for a little over uh, two years. And we have some of the finest leaders in the arts world right here in New South Wales. They all do a wonderful job. Uh, but why Lisa shines to me is that what she does is outside the square. It's visionary. It's founded in honesty and integrity. And it truly is wedded together, making sure that the arts world is valued by the communities in which it operates and providing, and she provides a platform on which the government now um, places and prides its strategic direction in, 
is creating access, demonstrating excellence and growing strength in our arts world. So ladies and gentlemen, as the president of the Lisa Havilar Fan Club, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage to talk to you today, Miss Lisa Havilar. Thank you, Troy. I would like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and thank Elders past and present for allowing us to be here today. I acknowledge and thank Catherine Brisbane. Is that better? Okay. Now? Okay. I'll start. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Catherine Brisbane and the Board of Currency House. I'd like to acknowledge the Chair of the CarriageWorks Board, Sam Moston, and CarriageWorks Board Directors Sue Cato and John Mitchell, and our previous Chair, Peter Lobston. I'd also like to thank Lizanne McGregor for letting us be in this wonderful institution this morning. In this too cautious world, it has been our champions, such as the Deputy Premier and others in this room, that have consistently supported and believed in Carriage Works. I'd like to thank you for taking a leap of faith, showing belief in the new, in the future, and in a place that has no direct comparisons and is not easily understandable. The story of CarriageWorks is a great one. It was born, like all cultural institutions, through valiant battles, through triumph, through failure. CarriageWorks is a place that is grounded in its context. It is one of the very few cultural institutions in Australia to be imagined and created in this century, forever tied to now. Located in Redfern, the black capital of Australia, over 6,000 workers worked in carriage works every day, making trains, living lives. Those thousands of people shaped our national union movement and contributed to the development of New South Wales for over 100 years. Carriage works has a long history of equity. It is one of the first places to employ Aboriginal people on an equal basis and is the place where generations of new migrants were first employed. CarriageWorks is the next generation of cultural institution and one of the fastest growing in Australia. It is a step forward from the great sandstone institutions that have come before us. We are red brick, more suburban than civic, an entrepreneurial hybrid made for generations of workers for us to continue to work. So how are we this and how have we become this? We have, through our practice, rethought what a cultural institution is and can be in consistently modelling an, an ambitious multi-year strategy. Our strategy not only asks a lot of us, but asks a lot of our artists, our collaborators, our partners and our communities. We haven't let anyone labour under low expectations. So over the last four years, as the Deputy Premier mentioned, our audiences have grown and over a million people will engage with our programs this year. Our investment into our artistic program has grown by over 400% and this year we will commission and present over 54 projects supporting more than 850 artists. Our earned income has more than doubled in 2016 and CarriageWorks is forecast to generate more than $7 million in revenue. So how have we done this? We have developed and presented a contemporary multi-arts program where we work across contemporary arts, dance, music and performance. We have implemented an innovative business model in which we entrepreneur 75% of our turnover through the application of a curatorial framework that brings together our artistic program, major events and commercial programs. This is a circular model which is complex in application but very simple in form. We invest into our artistic program, which grows our profile, which in turn grows our commercial and major events program. These commercial returns are then invested back into the artistic program. We present a program that directly reflects the social and cultural diversity of New South Wales, that holds Aboriginal practice at its core and engages new communities. Cultural diversity is the key one of the key strategies within our artistic program, and 70% of our artists are from culturally diverse backgrounds. 
We have implemented a major multi-year cultural stra strategies, including a new $2 million strategy called Solid Ground in partnership with Blacktown Arts Centre that provides pathways for young Aboriginal people in Sydney and Western Sydney into the arts, into the arts and cultural employment. We have also just started New Normal, a national arts and disability strategy that will commission 10 major new works by artists with disability over the next three years. Despite what has been achieved over the past four years, it has not been without its challenges, as I'm sure you can imagine. Our growth to date has been achieved through taking an expansive notion of collaboration and embedding it across the institution. To integrate artist priorities into the heart of our strategic planning, we commissioned Agatha Goethe Snape to ask artists what they need from a cultural institution. We have taken new approaches to governance through the establishment of a skills-based board who work directly on the delivery of our strategy. We collaborate with the New South Wales Government who support us to take significant risks in the scale and ambition of our projects. This support has enabled us to constantly rethink our capacity as an institution. We have built long-term relationships with Destination New South Wales, the Biennale of Sydney, the Great Sydney Festival and the City of Sydney. And we are building new relationships with those around us, including the University of Sydney and Sydney Local Health District. And this year we will work with over 150 partners in the development of our, pro in the presentation of our programs. And we have thought, we have rethought and constantly rethink our management and operating systems to develop new hybrid models of activities and outcomes. Our curators and producers have been integrated into one team working across artistic, commercial and community outcomes. And now where we are physically is itself going through extraordinary change and expansion. As I expect you are aware, Carriageworks is located in the middle of the New South Wales Government's Global Development Corridor Central to Everly. This is a major opportunity for us as an institution to work in collaboration with the development that is happening around us to ensure connectivity and coherency across a critically important part of Sydney. We as an institution have a responsibility to respond to the social and cultural changes that will occur as a result of these developments. In turn, the developers and government have, are taking the opportunity to work with Carriageworks to ensure that their policies, structures and plans protect and amplify us as the major cultural institution within the development corridor. Cultural institutions should be radical and participatory. They should lie in the heart of their communities, providing moments of great joy and wonder. They should provide pathways, lead social change, and create on, and deliver on our individual and collective ambitions. We as a community and in, as individuals should demand a lot of our institutions. They must reflect our everyday lives, and allow us to step outside ourselves, even just for a moment. I was the director of Campbelltown Arts Centre from 2005 to 2011, and hello Michael, the current director. <laughs> um, Campbelltown is one of the fastest growing and most culturally diverse communities in the country. Campbelltown, like Redfern, like all suburban and regional areas, has complex social, cultural and political histories. It is the role of the cultural institution to be an active community participant. The strategy that we developed at Campbelltown Arts Centre was designed to deliver social plan outcomes through a culturally re relevant, internationally focused contemporary arts program. This collaborative artists and community led approach resulted in extraordinary audience growth, making Campbelltown Arts Centre at the time the most visited cultural institution outside of a metropolitan city. This artistic program, programming approach further enabled the leveraging of diverse government investment, including health, housing and crime prevention, which grew our turnover by over 400% during that period. At Campbelltown we created a new artistic model that delivered significant organisational gains through being relevant and establishing a direct relationship 
between artistic identity and contemporary issues. At Campbelltown, we never looked to the major institutions for leadership. We were our own leaders, not outside the centre, but constructing our own centre. We never attempted to educate anyone, and as an institution, we never saw ourselves as the professionals with the authoritative voice within our communities. We all yearn to be part of something that is bigger than us. There is the community that you imagine, but the one you haven't seen yet. You don't even know that it exists, but you feel that because of what you have heard and experienced, it could exist. Our young, culturally diverse audiences, our future communities, the ones that we imagine, the ones that are yet to exist, are looking for the detail, for the relationship, for the fine grain, for the experience. As the next generation of cultural institution, we are in the middle of that great age of creative entrepreneurship. No one understands this better than artists, and they are now turning away from the mega stadiums and from the mega megalopolis museums that are replicated in the same ways but in different forms across the world. They, as artists, are looking for community. From our perspective, collaboration has to be considered core business and the commercial and the public must be constantly colliding in new ways. Institutions need to be places that are entrepreneurial, expansive and multi-centred. We have to strive so that survival is not just the aim. At CarriageWorks, we have aimed for excellence with a clarity of purpose and an unflinching commitment to taking calculated risks. As a new institution, we have to work to earn the right to have an equal seat at any table, to compete equally within the known government policy context with those bigger and more established than us. Last year, New South Wales adopted its first ever arts and cultural policy, Create in New South Wales. This policy is being consistently applied by the New South Wales government with a great clarity of purpose. Within this policy framework, the government has clearly articulated a vision and provided opportunities for the sector to deliver outcomes. Not everyone agrees with the priorities, but everyone is clear on the direction and how they fit or not fit within a broader policy framework. Policies are critical rules and directions that everyone understands. This is good government and policy directed investment results in strong returns. Where things can fall apart for the arts is when decisions are made outside of a consistent and understood policy framework. Inconsistently applied policy and perceived government protectionism for parts of the sector result in inequity for some organisations and complacency by others. Michael Lynch set up the Australia Council's major performing arts fund over 20 years ago as a bold initiative that led to extraordinary growth and stability across the performing arts sector in Australia. 20 years later, those companies are still our major performing arts companies. But is that it? While I do not criticise the major performing arts companies, I wonder will there be any others coming through? Will we have the same group of major performing arts companies for the next 20 years? How do we ensure that we provide pathways and opportunities for new companies from the small to medium sector, such as Sydney Chamber Opera, Force Majeure and Performance 4A? to become the national performing arts companies of the future. Like any innovation in science or medicine, sustained, protected, performance managed government support is required. We should have an expectation that new work, new companies and new institutions have an equal opportunity to deliver on any level of ambition that they may have. We as a community should want this. It is also our responsibility to ensure that there are diverse, sustained education and employment pathways for our next generation of cultural leaders. I wonder in 10 years who is going to be the next direct, the, the director of Carriage Works, the Opera House or the Art Gallery of New South Wales. The ongoing support of these pathways are critically important for the development of our broader ecology. 
culture in Australia is strengthened by having a cohesive national arts policy, a policy that is ambitious and enables a new way of thinking about how we support the arts and to what level. The opportunity for this cohesive policy platform is now and is urgent. The Australian Council for the Arts in 2014 undertook a broad consultation with the sector which resulted in a strategy, a culturally ambitious nation. This expansive strategy created a bold new vision for how the federal government agency would support the arts. It will not surprise you to hear me say that I personally believe that until the arts are appropriately recognised within the federal budget and there is a cohesive national policy for the arts, the Australian Council will not be able to realise its ambitious vision. An artist that we recently collaborated with, Ellen Atsui, said that things have to break to start in order to start reshaping. It is even more important now that we strive to be ambitious, have higher expectations of our government, our partners, our communities and our artists. This new ecology also requires a different type of rigour, not only around what we make, but how we make it. When the next generation of cultural institution emerges, we need to make sure that it will be provided the space the support and the resources so it can be as ambitious, as difficult and as risky as the artist that it supports. I hope that we as a nation can support and sustain our artists, our organisations, our institutions. Support them to be places that we all hold in our collective memories. Places that reflect our streets, that deliver on our ambitions, we need to do something that means something for the communities that have just arrived and the ones that are here first, in this place. We need to change as fast as the suburb, the city, the state, to claim the ground of the new, the makers, the artists, and in the end, this will mean everything. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, thank you very much. It's been very good to hear how the way things have been done previously don't necessarily have to be the way things are done now. And particularly at this time of change, when there's a lot of change in our sectors, um, it means that we have to look at things differently. And I know you're doing that. Uh, and Catherine the other night was talking about what you would call a revolution in the way we look at things. Um, and I think that's up to all of us to be part of that conversation, not only within these four walls, but externally because if we don't actually talk externally about these things, nobody hears them. So I encourage everybody to be part of this conversation. And the neat segue into one of the ways you can do that is through Currency House.